You are listening to the Horse Radio Network, part of the Equine Network family. I grew up in a time where, in my opinion, it was very um, unusual for the student or junior rider to be close with or have really a relationship outside of um, riding and teaching. Uh, it was very unusual. I, I don't think that that was really the time that I grew up in. So I kind of took that and I wanted to do it differently. Um, I work with a number of different kids, all from ponies to amateur owners that are actually older than me. But I really pride myself on being able to communicate with my students. I I want them to feel comfortable. I want them to tell me if something's wrong, if they have a question, if they want to go over it one more time. Um, so I, 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 I'd like to have a close relationship with them. I like to be able to have a clear line of communication. Um, I, like I said, I grew up in a time where I, d- I don't think that that was very common. And I think that they benefit a lot from feeling comfortable to ask the question or to, uh, you know, tell me, hey, I don't feel great right now. I don't want to do this. I this um, whatever it may be. I I really pride myself on the ability to have open communication and just um, you know allow each other to know what's going on. Welcome to the Practical Horseman podcast. Featuring conversations with respected riders, industry leaders, and horse care experts. The show is co-hosted by Practical Horseman editors, and our goal is to inform, educate, and inspire. I'm Julia Boutenhaus, and this week's episode is with leading hunter rider and top trainer, Jeffrey Hesslink. Hailing from Shelburne, Vermont, Jeffrey played many sports as a child and always had a love for animals, especially horses. But he doesn't come from an equestrian family. An unfortunate accident that resulted in a broken arm as a kid became fortunate, though, when his doctors recommended horseback riding as rehab. Jeffrey calls that recommendation destiny because after just one riding lesson, he was hooked. Jeffrey then spent his junior years as a working student and catch riding in all three rings. He excelled in the equitation, and his junior year culminated in victory at the 2014 Yousef Talent Search Finals East. When he aged out, Jeffrey decided to forgo college to pursue his dreams in the equestrian industry. As he shares in this episode, Jeffrey knew he wanted to be a riding professional from a young age and always had a vision for his future. Well, his dreams came true. And now Jeffrey owns and operates his business, Hesslink Williams, in Wellington, Florida, alongside his partner, Brendan Williams. He's one of the leading hunter riders in the country and is a top trainer for children, juniors, and amateurs in the hunters, jumpers, and equitation. Some of his most recent accolades include being named the 2023 Pennsylvania National Horse Show Leading Hunter Rider, winning the 2023 $100,000 WCHR Central Hunter Spectacular at Traverse City Spring, and placing second at the 2023 USHJA International Hunter Derby Championship, both aboard drumroll. And in 2022, he piloted Montresor to the win in the prestigious $100,000 USHJA WCHR Peter Weatherhill Palm Beach Hunter Spectacular. During our conversation, Jeffrey gives tips for training young horses to success, shares his belief in open communication with his students, and speaks candidly about the challenges of making a name for himself in the hunter industry. Before we dive into the podcast with Jeffrey, I'd like to thank the sponsor of this week's episode, Purina, and share their message. Your horse has unique feed needs, and Purina has you covered. From breeding and growing, to senior horses, from performance horses to easy keepers, and everything in between, Purina has an extensive portfolio of research-backed options for your horse. 
There's no shortcut for quality nutrition. Cheaper isn't cheaper if it doesn't work. Put Purina's research to the test. Find optimal nutrition at any level at your local Purina retailer or visit PurinaMills.com to learn more. Now, enjoy the episode with Jeffrey. So I'd like to welcome today Jeffrey Hessling. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited. So number one question I always like to ask is, how did you get interested in horses and riding to begin with? Um, that's a good question. I was born into a completely non-horsey family. Um, I was born and raised in Shelburne, Vermont, which, as you could imagine, is not a huge horse uh, part of the country or world for that matter. So uh, it was Sounds a little cold. bit of a... Yes, very cold. Um, I grew up playing some different sports. Um, and I had just always had a very strong love for animals, especially horses. Um, and I broke my arm when I was little. And uh, one of the doctors recommended I go and ride horses to kind of help with that rehab process. Um, and so I did. My dad brought me to a local lesson barn. And uh, yeah, the rest is history. Uh, they didn't they didn't know what they were in for, but uh, I instantly fell in love with the sport and was lucky to get where I am today. And then that led you yeah. into this incredible career that you've had. So, you know, of course, you mentioned your love of horses, which we all have. And but what other than that has kept you involved in the sport for so long now? Um, I would consider myself very lucky that I knew that this is what I wanted to do professionally and for the rest of my life. Um, I think a lot of younger kids or, you know, some of my siblings and some friends I have struggled to know what they wanted to do in their life or what direction they wanted to take as far as their career. So I consider myself very lucky that I knew from a very young age. Um, And my family did not come from probably the best financial position to be able to support me. They did everything they could. Um, But I was a working student for most of my junior career. And after I aged out from being a junior, I bounced around from job to job for a few years. Um, Again, just I always knew this is what I wanted to do. And I always knew how I wanted to do it. But I just really didn't know how to get there. Um, And I think I crossed paths with a few amazing people um, and got some nice chances and some opportunity in the sport. And I find myself uh, living the dream every day, thanks to everyone around me. Could you speak about some of those people who have influenced your career so far? I rode with Don Stewart and Bibby Farmer Hill uh, in my younger years. Uh, through ponies, through equitation. And I'd like to thank them for giving me not only a love of the sport, but a great foundation. And then after that, I worked with Andre Dignelli and the team at Heritage Farm. Um, And I think I really resonated with Andre's teaching style and his calmness and ability to kind of channel your nerves or... um, high pressure situations to your benefit. I think that was a really strong tool that I took from him. Um, And then as a professional, I'd like to thank, you know, the people that took a shot on me. I chose not to go to college. Um, I was offered a full scholarship to go to school and it was something my parents obviously really wanted me to pursue. Um, but I was just convinced that taking myself out of this industry for four years, when I could use those four years uh, to my benefit in the community, I just couldn't wrap my head around it. So mm-hmm. that being said, right. the the few people that you know took a shot on me in terms of a young professional that maybe wasn't as proven or... Um, successful at the time I really want to thank them I think they took you know they took they took a a leap of faith a little bit and um I was so lucky with the people and the families that supported me in my younger and still to this day but specifically my younger years as a professional you know 
And as a professional now, you have your business, Hesslink Williams. So can you speak a little bit about, you know, when you got that business off the ground and what Hesslink Williams is like as a business? Yeah. Um, like I said, I, I always had a vision. I always knew what I wanted to do, how I wanted to do it, how I wanted things done, what horses I wanted. I always could see it in my head, um, but I could never mm-hmm. figure out how to, how to get there. Um, so, uh, my partner and business partner, Brendan, uh, Brendan Williams, he has been my biggest supporter and, uh, we've been together now for almost 10 years and this was something we both envisioned and wanted very badly for ourselves. Um, and I think we've done a really, really great job producing it. Um, and I have a him to thank for much of my success. Um, he, our business works very, very smoothly and well, in my opinion, I obviously take on a lot of the riding, showing and training responsibilities as well as day-to-day plans and management of the horses. Um, But he is definitely the behind the scenes guy and definitely does most of the work. He's logistics, planning, billing, um, all sorts of things, travel related and uh, clients, vet, barrier, et cetera, et cetera. So um, it just works really well. And I think we've figured out how to bring out the best in us and our horses and clients. And, yeah, I'm really lucky to have him. And you came up in your junior career, you had, you know, amazing success catch riding quite a bit in, you know, pretty much all three rings and really made a name for yourself. When you think about the most important or influential horses in your career thus far, who would you say that those horses are? That's a good question. Um, as a junior, yes, you're exactly right. I got to catch ride and ride a lot of different horses in all three rings. Um, specifically, as a junior, two horses stand out to me um, as horses that I will remember forever. One of which um, was an equitation horse owned by Heritage Farm. Her name was Sierra. Um, she was an older, more seasoned equitation horse. And like I said, I grew up, uh, you know, a small town Vermont boy who wanted to ride horses and had this dream and watched all the finals and had big aspirations. But I never really thought that that was something in the cards for me. And she was a more famous equitation horse of that time. And she just completely changed my my life. I just felt so lucky to ride her. And I felt like we had such a strong bond. She was the horse that got me my first ribbon at an equitation final. And it was just a feeling I, I really never thought I was going to have. Um, so, you know, I'm forever grateful for that, uh, for to her for that. Um, and then second, I would say uh, a horse named Candy Windsor Z, who is the horse I won the USCT finals on uh, in 2014. He, he, I think, really taught me about developing a horse and what it means to produce a horse. Um, he was a six-year-old at the time and had never done an equitation final um, and really didn't have that much equitation experience for that matter. Um but he was incredible and I spent most of that year with him. And um, there was a few horses in the mix for me to ride at the USCT finals that year. And Andre felt really strongly that I needed to ride Canny. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm obviously grateful uh, we chose him. He was, he was amazing. So it really taught me what it means to believe in a horse, bring a horse along, develop a horse. Um, and the process of making a green horse, maybe eventually a more experienced horse, for sure. Um, as a professional, uh, the first horse I bought actually myself, his name was Cataretto, and I brought him along similarly, similarly as Canny, and I did him in the derbies, and I brought him along as a six-year-old and finished second at the derby finals, my first year ever doing derby finals. So that was another 
course that I would say really got me off the ground in terms of believing in myself, um, Mm -hmm. in developing a horse, bringing a horse to a national championship and kind of trusting my program and what I knew was right. Um, Those were all three amazing horses. And now I consider myself extremely lucky because I have a stable full of, well, in my opinion, the the best horses in the country. So um, I couldn't just pick (laughs) one now that I ride for sure. They're all amazing, but I those were bet. Three I mean, every horse, my... I feel like every horse that you come out on is just such a stunner and you ride them so beautifully. And you are one of the leading hunter riders in the country and have been for years now. Uh, if you could name a couple of your biggest successes, you know, in the show ring, what, which ones stand out to you the most? Um, aside from those equitation accolades that Mm -hmm. we just talked about, um, I would say, you know, the WCHR program was always something that, again, I dreamed about competing in and grew up watching the top hunter riders in the country compete at Capital Challenge and then in the night class at WEF. And I just, it was, again, always a dream of mine, but I didn't really think that it was attainable or maybe it was something that I would get to in the far, far future. So. For sure, winning uh, the Palm Beach Hunter Spectacular um, a few years ago on Montresor was such a big (laughs) moment for me. And again, a real moment where I was like, oh my gosh, like, wow, I had to pinch myself. But I was like, I think I can do this. Like, this is, I think that I'm I'm good enough. So that was one. Um, uh, Also... I finished second at the Derby finals this year on drum roll and he was absolutely incredible. It was one of the most amazing two rounds that I feel like I've put together. Um, Really my whole career on drum roll, I think is, is I'm proud of my first class I ever did on him was the Hunter spectacular, uh, the central one in Michigan. And I had never showed him in my life. I'd only jumped him one other time and I won that class. Um, $100,000 $100,000 class my first time ever. So that is always just going to mean a lot to me because I think it just really set the tone for me and Drumroll's relationship. And I think when you start, uh, you know, with a horse in that way, it just, it really solidified like what we were going to do together and how we felt towards each other. And I think we just have this immense respect for one another. And I, I, I'm so grateful to get to ride him. And in this sport, you know, of course, you have these big moments, these beautiful moments of winning, but horses can be unpredictable and things don't always go as planned. So when those times happen and, you know, maybe you're not winning as much as you'd like to or you don't win a class that you thought, you know, you had in the bag or just kind of in a slump. What do you do to deal with something like that, If you're whether you're going through a period of it or, you know just a bad show. How do you deal with, you know, maybe some down moments? Yeah, that's a good question. And definitely something that I have had to experiment with and sort of manage myself. I, um, I'm a very high strung person by nature and I put a lot of pressure on myself. Um, especially nowadays riding the caliber of horses that I have. Um, I think it's easy to expect perfection every time and obviously that's just an impossible goal um mm-hmm. but i really try at the end of the day i've learned i just try to listen to my horses and tell them you know have them tell me what's going on what do you need what can i do differently or better um and for me i i've learned over the years that i don't you know i'd like to think i don't have I don't need to prove myself as much anymore. And I, I'm allowed to let my horses experience showing in a way where they learn something versus expect a almost perfect round every time. Um, I've really enjoyed this year specifically have a number of younger horses um, that maybe aren't quite at the caliber of the older, more seasoned ones. And I've really enjoyed bringing them along and, um, you know, allowing them to make mistakes, but then hopefully they'd learn from it for the next time. So um, I just try to keep that all in perspective. Um, 
yeah, this sport's very easy to get wrapped up in and and compare yourself and think yeah. that you're only as good as the last round you do. And I think that's, again, an impossible goal to attain. And I think it's important. And really, the most successful people in this sport are able to separate those things and realize that they are animals and that this, you know, this is a, a very, very hard sport and hard to predict. And I think always trying to reinvent yourself and improve upon and help your horses and listen to them is is the way to, to do it the best. Whether you're preparing for something like Derby Finals or Hunter Spectacular, or you're just going into a class with a young one, do you ever get nerves? And how do you handle those nerves if you do get them? Uh, yes, like I said, I'm a very, very high strung person. And as a young mm -hmm. kid, a junior rider, I struggled immensely with uh, nerves. I spoke to sports psychologists. I had, you know, breathing exercises, regimens in the morning or showing that I had to follow, um, you know, down to the, the every detail. Um, and over the years I've learned, I think, to manage that and kind of use it to my benefit now. Um, for sure, big classes, spectaculars, derby finals, things like that. I, um, I need to definitely manage it. And, you know, the best thing for me really is to be nowhere near what the, sh what that's, what's happening, whether that's the show or the the class is going or whatever honestly being away from it is better for me i i need to be you know distracted almost um and just not right. thinking about oh well this person did well or oh that person did bad or you know this was mm -hmm. harder than expected or it walked different than it you know i i feel like i'm better i i know my horses i make a plan and i try to stick to it um and normally that's that's how it goes uh the best for me and do you have a routine before a big competition like that or any superstitions? Like one thing that I do in my riding routine is like, I can't put my gloves on before I get on the horse. Do you have any little thing like that or routine before a class? I do for sure. Um, like I said, I worked, <laughs> I worked on it for many, many years. So I've tried to perfect it. Um, two things that really resonated with me were, um, breathing exercises uh, when i'm on the horse when i'm walking the course and in the schooling ring specifically i can feel my heart racing or the adrenaline pumping and i have to make myself breathe and uh, me and my coaches call it 636 it's you breathe in for six seconds you hold it for three seconds and you breathe out for six seconds um mm -hmm. and i do that too it, <laughs> yeah, I can just really feel my heart rate go down. I can feel the butterfly feeling eliminate a little bit. Um, so that's definitely one. And I think that that's probably scientifically proven. Um, the other one is most big classes or classes that I really care about or know that I'm going to be nervous for. I have to eat a banana before. Um, again, a coach I worked with mm. when I was younger told me that the potassium and the ingredients that make up a banana uh, can help eliminate the physical feeling of butterflies in your stomach. Um, so again, and we've talked about it for many, many years, but whether that is a mental thing or a physical <laughs> thing, I do feel way better knowing that I've eaten a banana. So that is my two, uh, my two nervous go-to habits. If it works, it works, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I'd like to get a little bit into your training now. Do you think that you could define a training philosophy that you have with your horses? Um, with my horses, I, like I said, I just, I'm so incredibly, I'm so incredibly lucky to work with the horses that I have. Um, they are so talented by nature. And I've learned over the years that, um, you know, not everything always needs fixing or better or to be improved upon. I really try to keep my horses fit physically. I like them a little bit more fit than I think most hunter people do. And I don't think they need to practice that much. So, you know, fit, happy and healthy. Um, I think they they produce good rounds 
week after week. Um, and it's something that I found has worked really well for me. I, 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 uh, I think that they, they, uh, jump very well out of uh, less is more. Could you speak to that fitness routine a little bit? Like what does your week look like at home as far as exercises with your horses? Or do you have a particular exercise that you like to do all the time to keep your horses fit? Yeah, um, we actually keep it pretty simple at home in terms of jumps. I really, I keep the jumps plain. I want the horses to use the jumps at the show. I want them to be engaged. So I don't, like many other hunter barns, have quote unquote hunter jumps that they need to practice over. I, I don't right. really believe in that. Um, I'd say they jump probably one to two times a week if they're not showing just to up, you know, upkeep that fitness, that jumping muscle. But um, I believe in in getting them out. I like them moving, not constantly, but you know, almost every single one of my horses will go outside and get ridden at least once, maybe twice, um, whether that's a trail ride in the morning, then turn out for the, you know, mid-morning afternoon, get ridden in the afternoon. I also use lunging um, a little bit more than, you know, just a quieting mechanism. I use it in the, whether that's in the Pessoa or the rig or the ropes, I like the horses to work with mm -hmm. um, no saddle, no rider, and just sort of be free to express themselves, but also be exercising at the same time. So, you know, I do, I try to keep it very horse specific. I think they're all so different and each horse in my barn involves a much different program. Um, but yeah, that's, that's what I like them, them out of the stalls as much as possible for sure. You spoke a little bit earlier about how you have had some young horses that you've brought up from a really young age, and now, you know, they've had so much success with you. So could you talk a little bit about how you bring those horses along, what exercises or training you use to make them so successful? I, the best advice I can give is, I would say, honestly, it all sort of goes hand in hand with what I've been saying, but I never mm -hmm. want them to feel anxious or like they can't do something. So a little bit like I was just saying with my students, I like to keep it not necessarily simple because they don't know what they're doing, but things that they physically can do. I don't like to put the jumps up super big uh, originally. And like, I'm not a big believer in training lead changes or um jumping the course per se over and over i i, I like to keep it simple right. i think that obviously the basics is flat work i like my young horses to be broke i think that them having basic flat work is gonna just make all of it so much easier um so i i try to get them as broke as they can be on the flat and um then just similarly jumping you know i i think they don't need to practice so much once they know what their job is, uh, more more fitness. And then as they get fitter, I like to ask more of them. Um, young hunters specifically, you'll see me do a gymnastic. Uh, I would say I use that gymnastic while they're young to, you know, obviously they don't they don't really understand all of it quite yet. So it's a fitness element and it's also an element where I'm not really helping them, they're figuring it out on their own. I trot into right. the exercise. It's a bounce to a one to a one or a bounce, bounce to two or whatever it may be, oxer, vertical oxer. They have to gauge it themselves. They have to gauge the front rail, the back rail. They have to gauge how tight or long it is and they have to come up with it themselves. And eventually I think that they learn to make a better shape over the top of the jump because of it versus I'm jumping single jumps and or I'm just jumping the course. Well, that's sort of that's sort of less thinking on their part. They can sort of, you know, rely on me to help. Oh, it's an outside five. Well, you know, Jeffrey's going to know to do five strides and how long it is or how short it is, et cetera. So that's right. that's a, a big uh, technique that you'll see me use with young horses for sure. And now similar questions in the direction of students, because you do teach some students, correct? Yes. Yeah. 
So could you tell us a little bit about your teaching style for students? Yes. Um, I have, again, not to, I feel like I've said this a thousand times, but I'm just so lucky to work with the people and uh, kids that ride with me. I just love them so much. Um, And I grew up in a time where, in my opinion, it was very um, unusual for the student or junior rider to be close with or have really a relationship outside of um, riding and teaching. Uh, It was very unusual. I I don't think that that was really the time that I grew up in. So I kind of took that and I wanted to do it differently. Um, I work with a number of different kids, all from ponies to amateur owners that are actually older than me, but I really pride myself on being able to communicate with my students. I I want them to feel comfortable. I want them to tell me if something's wrong, if they have a question, if they want to go over it one more time. Um, So I, 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 I like to have a close relationship with them. I like to be able to have a clear line of communication. Um, I, like I said, I grew up in a time where I, d- I don't think that that was very common. And I think that they benefit a lot from feeling comfortable to ask the question or to, uh, it, you know, tell me, Hey, I don't feel great right now. I don't want to do this. I, this, um, whatever it may be. I, I really pride myself on the ability to have open communication and just, um, you know, allow each other to know what's going on. It's great to hear you have such a wonderful relationship with your students because it kind of breaks down that barrier of being able to say to your trainer, you know, could you repeat that? Or could we go over that again? Or, you know, maybe I'm not so comfortable doing that. So, you know, I really respect and appreciate that that's something that you brought into your program. Yeah, I just think it really eliminates the gray area. And if they feel comfortable and they can communicate really how they're feeling or what they're thinking, I think I just really, I honestly um, think it's why they have as much success as they do. So yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to keep with it. (laughs) Yeah, definitely. That's so wonderful to hear. And also a similar question to what I asked about your horses, but as far as exercises go, So with your students, do you have a favorite exercise or a type of work that you think is really important for them? Um, I would say the same. I'm sort of um, I'm sort of a less is more type person and I'm a big confidence guy. I, I want them to feel confident. I want all my students to feel like they could conquer the world. They could jump a Grand Prix. They could jump the Olympics. Um, So we keep it again a little not basic, but simple at home. It's exercises that they can, ex- they can use their eye, they can understand stride and track and all the sort of things that you need to be able to ride and, and execute the courses. But it's confidence. It's knowing you can do it. It's knowing the horses can do it. It's not over facing either of them. Um, so I would say repetition is, is a big thing that I use in terms of uh, the students. They they just do it over and over and over and over until it becomes second nature. Um, but again, yeah, I, I like to keep it a little bit simple. I don't like to overface them. And just a couple more wrap up questions here. So, yeah. and this might be the toughest one I ask you. Um, and I hear from others that it is a little bit hard to answer, but why do you think that you have been so successful as a rider in your career thus far? I would have to say the people around me. Um, I always, when I set out on my own and part of when I said earlier that I always knew what I wanted to do and how I wanted to do it, I just wanted to create a space and a barn where everyone loves everyone and there's a lot of positive vibes and it's sort of this family element to it. Um, that's just all I wanted to kind of produce. So ever since we started, that's been something that I've really tried to curate. And I think it's really 
been I've been so lucky and I'm so grateful for the amazing clients and owners and supporters that have been with me for so many years. But they have just we've just had so much fun and so much success. And and, you know, I think when good people come together and and they're doing a cool thing, I don't know, it just sort of all seems to happen very seamlessly. So I'm so I think my owners and supporters and staff and vets and farriers all through the year we just make such a good team and i i i have them to thank i think and what would you say is the hardest part of this sport for you and that could be anything from emotionally to physically to financially what would you say um i would say for me it was really hard for me to feel accepted in the first mm. stages of my career. Like I said, um, you know, I was young. I chose not to go to school. Um, and I was like, I want to do this. and I want to be a professional and I want to, you know, hopefully be successful one day. And um, I feel like my peers, other professionals, specifically other older hunter riders um one didn't respect me and two didn't really accept me in the community and that was really hard for me um to accept um and it really took a lot of time and kind of mental ability to be able to comprehend that you know hey I don't really need those people and I don't need their acceptance and I know what I'm doing and I'm trusting my program and my gut and that's that's enough for me um, and it's clearly working and, um, I'm, you know, the people that are around me and support me are there and I don't need, uh, anyone else. So that was just something that, uh, took a while for me to really understand that, um, I always tried to make everyone happy and like me and feel accepted, but you know, it's just, I think in this sport, it's not really the reality. Um, so yeah, it just took me a number of years to kind of feel, feel good, confident in my skin. All right. My next question was going to be, do you have any advice for your younger self? But it sounds like that kind of answered that question. <laughs> uh, yeah. I wish I could tell my younger self just that. <laughs> yeah, I totally get it. And uh, so what's next for you? We obviously have WCHR week coming up in a couple of weeks here in Wellington. I assume, you know, that's probably a one of the biggest week of the year for you, if, or one of them, I should say. So what's next? Yeah, um, definitely focusing on that. Uh, I have a buy into the night class this year. So um, hoping uh, to have some fun in that, hopefully have some students qualify for it alongside me. Um, focusing on some of the derbies later in circuit. And uh, I have some new horses that I just purchased. So I'm excited to kind of get them up and running. And uh, yeah, I'm excited. Well, that sounds great. And good luck with everything. Thank you. Thank you so much. And before we wrap up here, is there anything that you would like to add? Yeah, I mean, I think I've said it, but I just want to thank my whole team. Uh, Brendan Williams, Bethany Lee, Faith McKee, Sabrina, Fox, uh, our vets, farriers, and my longtime owners and clients, the Swannies, the Signorinos, and the Sonneborns, as well as the uh, Treases. I just want to thank you guys so much. And uh, it's been a fun, fun journey. And I'm excited for what's to come. And uh, yeah, you can follow me on Instagram. Uh, uh, it's Jeffrey Hesslink, just my name. So Awesome. Well, thank you again so much for taking the time to speak with me today. I really enjoyed our conversation and I know that our listeners will as well. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so, so grateful. Thanks for listening to this week's episode with Jeffrey Hesslink and a big thank you to the sponsor of this week's episode, Purina. Learn more at PurinaMills.com. You can subscribe to the Practical Horseman podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. While you're there, please rate and review the show. Also, tune into our mini-sode series, The Fod Pod, where you'll hear audio lessons from our favorite Equestrian Plus clips. 
From short training tips to how-to videos and insider access to private clinics and lessons, learn from top experts in the dressage, hunter, show jumping, equitation, and eventing disciplines with Equestrian Plus. Watch exclusive interviews and lectures, slow motion demonstrations, and step-by-step -step tutorials taught by top-level pros, and explore cross-discipline topics such as groundwork, rider fitness, and stable management. When you tune into the FOD Pod, listen closely for a promo code for 15% off your Equestrian Plus subscription. Thanks again for listening to this week's episode. I'm Julia Boutenhouse, and you've been listening to the Practical Horseman Podcast. <laughs>